Jaya Sriman Narayana Jaya Bhagavan Shri Krishna Jaya Shri Guru Sanatana Dharma Jayate Dharma Rashtra Jayate Om Hari Om Namaste, everyone. It is absolutely wonderful and my privilege and my honor to be here again with you today as we are every Monday for our live stream satsangha. Thank you all very much for being here with us. And as people continue to trickle in, because I know it takes maybe a minute or two for uh, people to start coming here and realizing that the live stream has started, let me first just say a few very quick things just to repeat what I often say, usually say at the very beginning of these live streams. And that is, first of all, when you have a chance, please feel free to visit our website, dharmacentral.com. And when you're there, please take a look at our many books that are available, all talking about a variety of topics related to this wonderful path known as Sanatana Dharma. Also feel free to join our email list, which you'll see as soon as you go there to dharmacentral.com. Also, if you would like to, please feel free to become a member of the International Sanatana Dharma Society. It is precisely this movement, the International Sanatana Dharma Society, that sponsors these weekly live stream satsanghas that we do uh, for so many people throughout the world and so many dozens and dozens of different nations. So please feel free to become a tithing monthly member, a monthly tithing member of the ISDS. And that way you will help us tremendously to continue with all the many projects that we're working on. Also, when you have a chance, if you have not yet done so, please subscribe to this channel. If, as I always say, if this is your first time here, you're going to be in for a surprise. You'll see that the sort of information that we present is unlike anything that is available anywhere else on the Internet, regardless of whatever the platform is. That you want to that you want to mention. What we do is extremely unique, and uh, and very depthful and extremely authentic. So please feel free to subscribe. Um, also feel free to please like this video whenever you can. That helps us to then uh, go up in the algorithms, and then as a result, other people can see this this video. So with that, let me dive into what we're going to be talking about today. And let me just let people know that we're going to be doing something very unique today. Extremely unique. Indeed, it's not something that I was really even planning on doing due to the very esoteric nature of this topic um, until approximately two days or so after the last live stream that we did. But let me explain what, what happened very specifically. It's a very interesting thing, give you a little bit of uh, inside information, kind of behind the scenes. Well, for those of you who were here last time, you remember that I gave a talk then followed as usual by questions and answers. And one of the questions was very specifically about what is called the caste system. And <clears throat> it was a very good question. And I explained how, yes, we don't follow what is called the caste system because this is a corrupted version of what in actuality in Sanskrit is called Varna, Varna, the Varna system. And I'm not going to uh, recap what I said about that. You can feel free to watch the, uh, the uh, last live stream, the video of that. But in my answer to this question, I also explained how, indeed, how one's varna is determined is not so much by one's parentage. In other words, the idea that, oh, for you to be a brahmana, necessarily, you must have been born to two parents who were brahmanas. No, that's the caste system, and that's silly. 
<laughs> we all know that ultimately, as individuals, we all have our own specific psychophysical natures, etc. And I explain this to people that know what is considered to be a Brahmana, as, as an example. And really, this is true for all the four Varnas. But what is considered to be a Brahmana, very specifically, is an individual who displays in their own personal characteristics the attributes of a Brahmana. In other words, a person who acts like a Brahmana, a person who has naturally, very naturally, inherently, the interests of a Brahmana. That is, they are very, they're very clean, they're very cleanly, they are individuals who are very wise, they're individuals who are very thoughtful, philosophical, intellectual, they love to teach, they are very spiritual people, etc., etc., etc. That individual is considered to be a Brahmana. And again, regardless of what the person's parents are. Now, in explaining this to people, which is really for anyone who seriously looked at the Vedic scriptures, this is kind of common knowledge, plus it's just logical, of course, but it's also just kind of no common knowledge that this is what the Vedic scriptures teach. But when I was explaining this last time, I even explained how indeed there is one Upanishad very specifically, in which the totality of this Upanishad describes this, exactly what I just said, and says the exact same thing, and indeed goes into some detail about how, again, one's learning is not what determines if a person is a Brahmana, one's birth, one's body, etc., etc., and it goes on and on like this. Uh, rather, an individual who is enlightened is considered to be a true Brahmana. So again, I explained how there was an entire Upanishad that explains this. Now, to give the uh, little insider story, interestingly, approximately two days after this live stream was occurred and then was available as a video, we got a very interesting message from a caste-born Brahmin. And you'll notice that I make a distinction between Brahmana, which is the correct word, and a Brahmin, which is someone who uh, indeed is very caste-conscious and they think they're a Brahmana, uh, indeed, because they are part of a caste. Well, we got a message from an individual who was Indian, and, you know, it has nothing to do with the person's nationality, but he was Indian, and he was, quote-unquote, born a Brahmin, i.e., his parents were Brahmins, so therefore he thought he was. And he challenged us uh, in a very, uh, very vociferous sort of way, actually, in fact, quite nasty, <laughs> actually. I won't share the contents of his message to us because parts of it were quite nasty. But he essentially said, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm a true Brahmin because I was born in the Brahmin caste. You must be born in the Brahmin caste. It has nothing to do with who you are as a person, etc., etc. Uh, and then he challenged me, my, myself, personally, and called me a fraud, called me a fake, uh, essentially because I was not born quote-unquote, a caste Brahmin like him. <laughs> and he even challenged the fact that such an Upanishad, as I mentioned, even existed. Indeed, he said, oh, I've read all the Upanishads, and I've never seen such an Upanishad. You're making this up. You're a liar. You're a fraud, etc., etc. Well, our response is, I'm going to be now commenting on this Upanishad. <laughs> that does indeed exist. <clears throat> it is indeed the Vajra Suchika Upanishad, which is one of the established, standard, accepted 108 Upanishads. Indeed, this is one of the established Upanishads. It is one of 20, 22 what are called Samanya Upanishads, that is general Upanishads. And very, very specifically, it is attached to the Samaveda. So, indeed, this Upanishad that I mentioned does indeed exist. And <clears throat> it does indeed say what I claim that it says. <laughs> this Upanishad is easy to find. It's available in the English language. And this, this Upanishad itself consists of ten parts, of which we're not going to go through, obviously, the entire Upanishad. Uh, rather, we're only going to go through the ninth part of this Upanishad. But again, you can look up this Upanishad yourself, which again, this caste Brahmin uh, claimed I was making up and it didn't exist, etc. You can look it up online, just look up the name. And when you read the previous parts of this Upanishad specifically before the ninth part, which we'll look at, again, it goes very in-depth. This is the 
thesis of this entire Upanishad, that indeed what makes an individual a Brahmana is not their birth, not their body, not their deeds, and it goes on and on and on. Not this, not this, not this. Rather, what makes an individual a Brahmana is what we are going to talk about. I'm not going to give it away because I will read to you what it says. Uh, but before I do that, actually, before we jump into this, there are a few more interesting things that I want to say about this Upanishad. Because it's not merely enough that we look at the nature of Brahmana as explained in this, uh, in this uh, Vajra Suchika Upanishad. But rather, there are some very interesting things that we also need to know as far as background with this Upanishad. Now, several days ago, when I mentioned to one of my students that I was going to be speaking about this Upanishad, and I gave my student the name of this Upanishad, uh, they said something very interesting. They said, oh, that's an interesting name, Vajra Suchika Upanishad. That sounds very Buddhist. And in fact, from what you've read to me that you're going to be speaking about, it, it sounds slightly Buddhist. And I said to my student, well, that's not a mistake. Um, it's not that this Upanishad copied from Buddhism, but rather the other way around. Again, this Upanishad is thousands of years old. It goes back way before the Buddha himself, actually. It's attached to the Samaveda. So indeed, this is Upanish an Upanishad that goes back several thousand years before the Buddha. But interestingly, my argument is that indeed, Buddhism itself, indeed the Buddha himself, most likely, if anything, borrowed some ideas and even some phraseology of what he taught, but then especially later Buddhism, and especially as found in Mahayana Buddhism very specifically, uh, that he borrowed and Buddhism has borrowed from this Upanishad. So, for example, in the very title itself, Vajra Suchika, the title itself is a very interesting title. And you'll notice that even the uh, name of this talk is a very, very interesting name. The Doctrine of the Diamond-Tipped Needle. This is the translation, Diamond-Tipped Needle. This is the translation of Vajra Suchika. Now, when it comes to these two words, the, the most important of the two is indeed Vajra. And Vajra is indeed a concept, a word and a concept that I want to talk about a little bit because it is very distinctly a Vedic word and concept. Indeed, it goes back to Rig Veda. You find it throughout the Puranas. You find it in many, many Vedic scriptures. But also, for anyone who has studied contemporary Buddhism, and again, to explain what I mean by contemporary Buddhism, what is contemporary Buddhism for me, is the Buddhism of roughly the last 2,000 to 2,200 years. So when we look at contemporary Buddhism, we also find this word, Vajra. Vajra in Buddhism itself. So obviously Buddhists borrowed this term as they borrowed most if not all of their terms indeed from the Upanishads, from Vedic yoga, from the Vedic scriptures themselves. As we know many Buddhist doctrines, Buddhist practices, etc. also were very heavily borrowed from Sanatana Dharma, from the Vedic. But this is yet one more instance of this borrowing phenomenon that we've seen, where Buddhism has borrowed from Sanatana Dharma, is in this word Vajra. Now, Vajra is indeed a very, very important word, and that is the case for several reasons, actually. And I want to first talk about this uh, as a foundation before we actually dive into the lecture for today. The term Vajra itself means several different things, and two very specifically. The term Vajra itself means thunderbolt, that's the first one of the, one of the meanings. The other meaning is diamond. And again, in the Sanskrit literature, as well as in later Buddhism, actually, you find both terms. You find the term Vajra as thunderbolt, again, going back to Rig Veda, where Indra, his primary weapon is known as the Vajra, or the thunderbolt. And it's considered to be one of the most powerful weapons in existence in the material world. It is a thunderbolt, quite literally, but it's more than just a material thunderbolt. It's a thunderbolt. The full, <clears throat> the full magnitude of which, as a weapon, is something that is almost unimaginable to us. 
the thunderbolt, the Vajra, that is being spoken of as the weapon of Indra, as the sacred weapon, has the ability to destroy a planet. It is more powerful than any weapon that any human being possesses. So this is one thing that the word means. Uh, Vajra, it means thunderbolt. The second meaning, interestingly, is diamond. The word Vajra also means diamond. And again, this is true both in Vedic and classical Sanskrit as well as in Buddhism, what is called Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit, and also Buddhism as a philosophical, let's say, um, school as well. The term Vajra also means diamond. Now, again, without going very in-depth into this, because this is something that, as you can imagine, I've actually studied very uh, very in-depth to the point of even writing uh, a paper, uh, an academic paper on this many years ago, something like 22 years ago. Uh, without going very in-depth, it's important that we understand why it is that this one word has these two very diverse meanings. Well, let's look at this in reverse order. First of all, Vajra as diamond. What this indicates is indeed the Atman itself. The Atman is compared to a diamond in so many ways. The Atman is self-illuminating. The Atman is something that is of the nature of beauty. It is something that is uh, indestructible. As we know, Krishna himself speaks about Atman, about our soul, as being something that is indestructible, that water cannot wet, that fire cannot burn, etc. The soul itself is something that is, by nature, eternal, always has existed, exists now, and ever shall be. This is the nature of the soul. So similar to a diamond. Of course, we know a material diamond is not literally eternal, but this is just meant to be a metaphor. It's just meant to explain in a way, what is the nature of soul? Also, in the same way that a diamond is multifaceted, that is, there are many different aspects to the diamond. You can look at the diamond from many different perspectives. In the same way, the soul is something that is infinitely depthful, which we can spend all of eternity understanding. Indeed, if we wanted to understand the full nature of even just another Atman, even just another soul, the truth of the matter is we can spend all of eternity understanding that person deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. So thus, this is the first meaning of the word Vajra as diamond and what it means. It's pointing very specifically to the idea of Atman, to the idea of consciousness. Now, when it comes to this second meaning of thunderbolt, what this means is thunderbolt in the sense of enlightenment. And interestingly, this is the accepted understanding, both Vedically as well as even in Buddhism, actually. The idea of Vajra as thunderbolt indicates what occurs at the time of enlightenment, that it is quite literally like being struck non-violently, but as dramatically by a thunderbolt, by being struck by lightning, and how our life changes dramatically from going to the sleeping state to then the awakened state that is known as enlightenment. So this is very specifically what these two terms mean, the, at least the translations of the term Vajra, and more very specifically. Now we get to the title of this Upanishad, which is again Vajra Suchika, which means diamond-tipped needle. Now what is this pointing to? And I'm kind of giving away the commentary on the section of this Upanishad that we're going to be looking at, but that's all right, actually. It's actually, in a way, better for you to know firsthand what precisely this is going to be speaking about. What Diamond Tip Needle means is the enlightened Atman as an irresistible force. The enlightened Atman, the enlightened soul, as a force that is irresistible. So thus bringing together both concepts, the concept of Vajra as diamond, that is, the actual Atman itself having self-realization, but more accessing the power, the inherent power of Atman as a force that is irresistible and that can defeat any evil in this world. Now, is this intriguing? It should be, because this is something that we all should be aiming at. So thus, this is why this talk is called the Doctrine of the Diamond-Tipped Needle. So with all that as a very, very quick preface so that we can now understand, let us now dive into this actual verse. 
as always, if you want to follow along, because this is more than a verse, it's, it's a large section of this Upanishad, it's section 9. Feel free to go to the description of this verse, I'm sorry, of this video, and you'll find the entire verse that is there. So feel free to, you can feel free to follow along if you desire. And this is how this proceeds. He indeed who, after having all his desires fulfilled as a result of perceiving, realizing directly, as an amalaka fruit in one's hand, and then it pauses there and then it goes on to the rest of this section. Let me just say very, very quickly before we get into the actual substance of this section, uh, section 9 of this Upanishad, what this is saying is for those individuals who indeed have had all their desires fulfilled. In other words, this now is going to be speaking about an individual who indeed has led their material existence in such a way that they're satisfied. They're satisfied with what this world has to offer, with the ups and downs. They're satisfied with having gone through lifetime after lifetime, etc., etc. And now they are ready to meet the full spiritual result of their true yearning and search. So now let's go on to the rest of this. The Atman, that is, the one who is beyond compare, that is, bereft of distinctions of clan, and is not composed of the constituents of Prakriti, materiality, and actionless, that is, free of all defects like the six infirmities, that is, old age, death, sorrow, delusion, hunger, and thirst and the six transformational states of existence, that is, birth, existence, growth slash development, transformation, waning and perishing, that is, of the nature of immutable reality, of consciousness, blissful as well as infinite and eternal, that is, an independent entity not deriving its existence and properties from, from any material thing, that is, devoid of material determinations, but is itself the support of infinite material determinations. That is, present in all living beings as the immanent soul, who pervades the interior and envelops the exterior of everything as ether, that is, as ether does. That is, possesses the attribute of perfect and complete akhanda, bliss, that is, incomparable, that is, known only through one's own experience and not merely through the reading of books or teaching by others, and is inferred only indirectly because it cannot be perceived by the senses, becomes free, that person becomes free of the defects of desire, attachment, and the like becomes endowed with the positive qualities, like tranquility, etc., becomes free of negative behaviors, like jealousy, greed, expectations, delusion, etc., and leads a life in which the mind is not tainted by pretensions, ego, and the like. And then finally, he alone who possesses the aforementioned characteristics is a brahmana, such is indeed the teachings of Shruti, Smriti, Itihasa, and the Puranas. There is no other way of attaining the state of a Brahmana. Very good. So I very sincerely and humbly pray that that individual who wrote into us and challenged us and said we were lying about this Upanishad and uh, that we, one needs to be born a Brahmana, etc., etc., one's qualities don't matter, etc. I hope he's listening tonight, because this should end the discussion. <laughs> if indeed uh, you, the individual who wrote into us, if you are indeed an individual who is Vaidika, if you're a Brahmana, you know what that word means. <laughs> if you are indeed Vaidika, i.e., if you are an individual who, uh, from an epistemological perspective, you accept the... Uh, the authority of the Vedas and the Vedic scriptures as your standard bearer of truth, 
this should end the conversation because I just quoted to you from indeed this Upanishad, but still we're going to go in depth into this Upanishad and with the time that we have, you know, we'll have to, unfortunately, we won't be able to go as in depth as I would like because as you can see, this is a long passage, but a little bit, we will go in depth. First of all, just to reiterate, this is section nine of 10 sections. We obviously do not have time to go through all 10 sections of the Supanishad. But from sections essentially uh, one to eight, uh, first the via negativa is explained. That is what a, what a Brahmana is not. And again, it explains that a Brahmana is not someone who is a Brahmana simply by birth, simply by their, by their, uh, by their body. That's quite literally deha. That's the word that's used previously. I forget which uh, section. It might be four, uh, four or five. Uh, a brahmana is not known merely by their actions, and it goes on and on like this. But now with nine, it explains precisely what is the nature of an individual who is to be called a brahmana. Such an individual is an individual who is acting like a brahmana. That is, they have enlightenment. They have self-realization, they know who and what they truly are, and they are living as such. In other words, they're not living as some people do, most people don't even do this, but they're not living as a person with a body who happens to also have an Atman. Rather, they are living as an Atman who also happens to have a body. They are living as soul, they are living as consciousness. So again, this is what this Upanishad is explaining in this section of it. But then just to reiterate, just to reiterate this, in the Upanishad itself, it explains that this is the Siddhanta, what is called the Siddhanta, that is the conclusion, conclusively stated by what? Again, the Vedic scriptures, and it even lists them in this Upanishad. It lists the Shruti, the Smriti, the Itihasas, and the Puranas. In other words, the Vedic literature, what would be uh, accepted by the vast, vast, vast majority of individuals who consider themselves to be Vedic as the Vedic scriptures. So thus it's establishing that indeed this Upanishad is not simply stating this, but this is based upon the teachings of the scriptures. Now, all that being said, let's go through this a little bit. Again, we are not going to have time to go through everything. So... The Atman is one who is beyond compare. So to compare Atman with anything that is not Atman is something that is not a possibility because there is a categorical distinction and difference between consciousness and that which is not consciousness. It's not merely that there is a difference, like there is a difference between vanilla and chocolate ice cream. No. The difference is categorical and ontologically distinct between Atman and that which is not Atman, meaning literally anything that is not Atman. Anything. Anything that you can conceive, perceive, anything that has existence or being to it. If it is not Atman, it is not like Atman in any way whatsoever. That's how radical the distinction is. So therefore, beyond compare. That is, bereft of distinctions of clan. Now, very, very important. What is meant by this is that, indeed, everyone belongs to some sort of clan, that is, some sort of, uh, let's say, materially designated people. Now, I need to be very careful about this, because it needs to be understood that, on the one hand, what this section is indeed saying is that we transcend, indeed, even our clan, even our ethnicity. But at the same time, do we recognize the importance of such things? Of course we do. You see, we transcend the physical body. Does that mean that we let the body rot? Of course not. We understand everything in relation to the soul in accordance with that individual existence context. So thus, indeed, we are to take care of our body, even though we're not the body. We are to honor our group of people, our clan, etc., even though we are not a part of that clan. But at the same time, indeed, we need to understand that ultimately we are Atman. That transcends all material designation whatsoever. So that's what this is saying. And again, just due to time, I'm going to be skipping several of these. Uh, I wish we had the time, but sadly we don't. And I'm just going to be pointing out some of the more uh, interesting and important things. So again, the Atman is free from all 
the defects like the six infirmities. These are infirmities that every living being has to suffer at one point. That is old age, death, sorrow, delusion, hunger, and thirst, etc. Every living being at some point or another experiences these things. This is why, indeed, the Vedic scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita, Indeed, even the Buddha himself later, much later, explained that the nature of this world is that the world is mixed. It is a place in which we have a mixture of both happiness and suffering. Well, these are the six infirmities, very specifically, that constitute suffering in this world. And then that is spatially oriented. Now, temporally oriented, we have the six transformational states of existence. And again, we all go through these things, if we live long enough to. <laughs> that we go through birth, we go through existence, we go through growth, transformation, and sometimes very often meaning offspring as well. And then finally waning and then perishing, that is coming to our natural death. This is something that indeed uh, every living being experiences, but that we as Atman ultimately transcend. It is the physical body alone that goes through all of these transformations, actually, both the spatial ones and, and the temporal ones as well numbering 12 in total. Now let's go on just a little bit more. And again, I'm trying to pick very carefully here. I can't talk about all of these. This is an interesting one, actually, that I would like to address a little bit. That is that the Atman is present in all living beings as the imminent soul who pervades the interior and who envelops the exterior of everything, as does ether. Now, this is a very interesting one that I can imagine for some people might be a little bit confusing. So let me unpack a little bit what's being said by this very specific sentence here. So again, we're talking about the nature of Atman, and the nature of Atman is present, first of all, in all living beings. Let's stop there. This is something that is very important. This is something that indeed is the teaching of Sanatana Dharma, of the Vedic tradition. You know, when it comes to this question of what is consciousness, who has consciousness, is, are there some living beings who actually are just kind of living automatons and they actually don't have consciousness to them? Is there such a thing as quote-unquote organic matter, etc., <laughs> etc.? Et well, there's a lot of speculation about this in many different sectors, especially New Age sectors where... Uh, people are just very confused and clueless about what is the nature of consciousness, but also many other spiritual and pseudo-spiritual sectors as well. So, for example, the question, well, does a tree have consciousness? Does a dog have consciousness? Or is it merely human beings alone who have Atman? Well, the Vedic scriptures are extremely clear about this. No speculation, no confusion whatsoever, no contradictions anywhere in the Vedic scriptures. The Bhagavad Gita speaks about this, the, the Upanishads, the Puranas, etc., etc. And here also is being said very specifically that that Atman, the Atman, the self, consciousness, is present in all living beings, and all living beings as the immanent soul. So what this means is any living being who you encounter is by definition living because of the presence of Atman. And if Atman were to be removed, what you would have would be a dead body. This is the difference between an ant who is on your desk right now, running around and looking for crumbs, versus an ant that's dead and not moving and not willing and not doing anything. The Atman is gone. That's the only distinction. This is true for every living being, that by definition, if you speak of X existent as a living being versus insentient matter, what makes it a living being is one and only one thing, and that is the presence of consciousness, the presence of Atman. So indeed, there is Atman in every living being, meaning you have a pet dog, you have a pet cat, there is an Atman there. That's why it's alive. That's why you can love it. You see, remove the Atman, have it be dead, and you would simply have a dead body there. Trust me, you would not love that pet dog if it were dead as much as you would if it were alive, if the Atman were present. And why? When the Atman is present, 
the person is present. That dog now has will and can experience and can go through states of emotion of joy and sometimes uh, sometimes sadness, etc., etc. And thus you can relate to it and love it. So the Atman is present in your pet. The Atman is present in, indeed, insects and all the various species of life. So this is something important to understand. But now let's go on with this sentence a little bit more because now it also explains a little bit more about the, the nature of how Atman relates to other things. So the Atman who pervades the interior. So thus, of course, when we talk about the interior of ourselves, that is when we go deeply into meditation, or when in any way we begin to experience the rich interior life that we have as living beings, what we are encountering is indeed the all-pervasive nature of that Atman. That Atman is there within us, that we are that Atman. So this is what this is saying. But it also envelops the exterior of everything, as does ether. And this is just an example that's being given. For those individuals who understand what is Akasha, what is called sometimes ether. Ether is, and I'm not going to go very deeply into Vedic physics, uh, but ether is one of the five elements that envelops all things. Ether is all around us, and it is through the element of ether that the other elements, as well as other items, have the ability to do. So ether envelops all things. In the same way, the way that Atman relates to the exterior world is that it envelops that which is exterior to it in order to understand it. This is a very, interestingly, a very epistemological statement and principle that's being spoken of here. That is, the way that Atman knows anything is that indeed being situated in its locus of being, that is where it presently is, it has the ability to reach out and envelop and thus perceive and understand that which is exterior to it. So therefore, I don't have many objects here on my desk, but I have a cup. So how is it that I have the ability to perceive that there is a cup? I, as Atman, envelop that exterior object with my perceptual ability. Thus, I can know it is a cup. Indeed, I can even interact with it. So that is what is being said with this, with this uh, latter portion of, of this sentence. Very good. All right, so that being said, now let's go on just a little bit more and have a little bit of time. Maybe I'll look at maybe one or two more of these. Let's look at the very ending of this very large section, actually, because this is very interesting. Because it also, once again, posits a via positiva and via negativa, juxtaposed to one another, and very specifically in speaking about our own internal qualities. So what this is saying is, so let me first read this, that an individual who knows their Atman becomes endowed with the positive qualities, like tranquility, etc. So let's stop there. An individual who has self-realization and now is fully attuned with the positive, inherent, noble excellences and qualities that they have within. So it gives tranqu tranquility as only one of really what are hundreds if not thousands of positive attributes that we indeed want to embrace that are natural to ourselves. So wisdom and goodness and virtue and etc, etc, etc. But then it juxtaposed the, uh, juxtaposes this with the negative. That is, that person also becomes free of negative behaviors. And then it gives a short list of what is actually a very long list. Just like the positive qualities, there's a long list of negative qualities. So the individual who has Atmagyana, who has realization of that Atman, they become free. They become liberated from these negative qualities, such as jealousy, and we can throw in their envy. Jealousy and envy are very close. Greed, expectations, meaning material expectations, delusion, etc. Very nice. And then finally, and leads a life in which the mind is not tainted by pretensions, ego, and the like. So this last part, and this is the last part I'll talk about, then we'll jump into questions. This last part is very important because this really serves as the foundational root, one could say, 
of why we find ourselves in suffering. Why do we find ourselves in suffering? We find ourselves in suffering because of avidya, because of ignorance. And why are we in ignorance? We are in ignorance because of illusion. And why are we in illusion? We are in illusion because we are misidentifying who and what we truly are. And that is called ahankara, that is false ego. And why ultimately do we do this? Because of these things that are mentioned here. Because of pretension, of false ego, etc. And in this way, this is what causes our suffering. So thus, when we have atma jnana, when we have self-realization, what ends up happening is we go to the very root of our spiritual problem, and that is false ego, pretension, etc. And we free ourselves from that entirely. And again, these are everything that's being discussed here. This, these are the goals, one could say, of the yogi. These are our goals as followers of Sanatana Dharma. And more, this is how you know whether or not an individual truly is a Brahmana, is that they are precisely this sort of individual who is being discussed here. That is, they know who they are. You know, to use this, uh, this Socratic motto, know thyself. This is an individual who has indeed achieved that goal, and they know themselves. That is a Brahmana. And more, they live as such. They behave as such. They serve as an example to others, as an individual who has self-mastery and self-knowledge. That, and that alone, is a Brahmana. Not someone who was necessarily born of two Brahmana parents, not someone who was born in the Brahmana caste, not someone who, and on and on and on. Rather, someone who has self-realization and God consciousness is a Brahmana. A Brahmana is one who knows Brahman. So all that being said, I thank you very much for listening to my discourse. Again, we went through this very quickly. As you can imagine, I could have spoken about just this section alone probably for hours and hours. But I do want to leave some time for questions. And at this point, let me signal to everyone that if you would like to ask any questions, now is the time to please feel free to ask any questions that you have. Good. <clears throat> good. I see some questions coming in. Very good. Here's a good one from uh, Varsaga. Namaste Acharyaji, do you consider all forms of games bad? <laughs> Even something like board games or card games. Let me let me say, um, you know, I know that uh, in the I know that I. Uh, I'm somewhat unique in that I'm very, very open and very honest about this when it comes to video games very specifically, and I don't want to go into this now. This is not the time or place. I've spoken about this in previous interviews and talks, how video games are something that are debilitating for people. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of studies that have been done to show this. There, there are thousands of testimonies, etc. So when it comes to video games very specifically, yeah, the, this... Video games are not something that are very helpful for individuals who want to live a yogic lifestyle, and especially mentally. Uh, what ends up happening to an individual cognitively and mentally is the very opposite of the yogic state, actually. So thus, for that reason, video games in themselves are considered to be something that yogically are debilitating. Uh, now, when it comes to other games, see, even when it comes to video games, actually, it's not that because you ask here very specifically, you say, do I consider them to be bad? Well, they're not bad in the sense that they're sinful or something like that. You're not going to get bad karma from playing any sort of game, a card game, video game, etc., etc. It's not that they're bad in this, uh, let's say, ethical sense, but rather, again, this is why I use the term debilitating. You know, it's like living a, a, an unhealthy lifestyle. Is it sinful, let's say, to live an unhealthy lifestyle? No, it's not sinful, but it's debilitating. 
it's something that's bad for you. In the same way, as far as any sort of other games, like you mentioned, board games, card games, etc. Oh, if an individual wants to, in a very sparing kind of way, you know, play a card game once in a while. You know, we don't believe in gambling, so there shouldn't be gambling involved. But just for fun, you want to play a board game. Something like that, you know, and I can't even think of the names of any board games right now, but let's say you wanted to play something like that. If you simply did that once in a while, there's nothing sinful about anything like that. There's not even anything uh, necessarily tremendously debilitating in a board game. Um, it's simply a matter of uh, could you have done something better with the time? Uh, probably. <laughs> so it's simply a matter of priorities. That's all. That's all. It's a matter of why not maximize that which is of great greatest uh, uh, of the greatest bene beneficial action for yourself? Why not do that which is going to benefit you the most? That's all. So it's not a matter of any of these games being again sinful or anything. Just a matter of they're a waste of time. <laughs> so I hope that answers the question. Uh, very nice. Uh, this is not a question so much, but it's a very, a very nice uh, statement, which I am very grateful for. And this is from Suman. As another Brahmin by birth, unfortunately, some so-called Brahmins do fall into the empty vessel makes more noise category <laughs> and are always uh, known to be the ones who stir things up. And he says, I, I agree with the charter chief. Well, thank you so much. Indeed, you know, I don't want pe uh, people to ever misunderstand that. Uh, because, you know, of course, when we talk about caste, caste Brahmins, necessarily we're talking about Indians. Oh, we have nothing against Indians whatsoever. Indeed, I have Indian disciples. I ha oh, have nothing but the greatest respect for, for Indians. Uh, indeed, my gurus have been Indian. Uh, Prabhupada was Indian, etc. But when it comes to very, very specifically these... Uh, caste fanatical, uh, and they tend to be brahmanas. Let's face it, they're not shudras. <laughs> the the ones who are ca caste born shudras don't make a big deal about that at all. In fact, they try to kind of hide it. It tends to very sadly be individuals who claim that they are brahmins, um, and so therefore, uh, in a way, the highest caste one could say. <clears throat> yeah, it's very unfortunate that. Uh, they are stuck in this idea that it's all birth, it's all birth, it's all birth. And it doesn't matter how many verses from the Vedic scriptures you can show them. Indeed, like I said, here is uh, not just a section. Again, we couldn't do the entire Upanishad. This entire Upanishad is predicated upon teaching this one thing, that being a Brahmana is not dependent upon birth, but upon knowing oneself. You can... I've had this experience for decades. You can show people these verses, and sadly, they stick fanatically to what they believe. And that is that, no, uh, as long as you are born a Brahmin, you are a Brahmin. Even if you're eating meat, even if you're drinking alcohol, even if you've never meditated or done a puja in your life, even if you've never done sadhana in your life, even if you, other than reading an Amar Chitra Kata comic book, have never actually studied the Vedic scriptures in your life. Because your parents are so-called Brahmins, somehow, miraculously, that makes you a Brahmin. But you can see how illogical this is. So, Suman, thank you very much for that confirmation. I truly appreciate it. Hmm. Uh, here's an interesting question. That is a, a very solo question, actually. This is War Machine 800. Is it possible that Abrahamic texts are not necessarily Asuric, but rather the result of biased or confused people misunderstanding revelation? May they have been too uh, egoistic for the full picture? Excellent question, and it is not possible to answer this question with a yes or no. And this is the reason why. That when we talk about, how do you state it, uh, Abrahamic texts, it's precisely that. It's the plural. So when looking at the multitude of these texts, so the dozens and dozens of books that comprise what is commonly called the Bible, that is Old Testament, New Testament, and the many books that are there in both Old and New Testament when it comes to the Quran, etc., the Hadith, 
the sayings of Muhammad, etc., etc. We must look at each of them individually. Uh, when it comes to, for example, the Old Testament, even with the Old Testament, and I've said this in the past, not on video, but in other places, there are some books that are better than others. There are some texts of the Old Testament that are indeed absolutely asuric. But then there are some texts that are there, the layers of which are so ancient and pre-Abrahamic, pre-Abrahamic, to the point where, oh, you know, there's something of historical value that is there where you can learn something about, oh, the history of the Middle East, etc., etc. Then when it comes to the New Testament, indeed, you need to look at all the individual texts, plural, of the New Testament. Some are wonderful. So specifically, in what is the commonly agreed upon <laughs> mainstream New Testament, the four Gospels are wonderful. By extension, I personally would say all the Gospels, because, of course, we know that it's not merely a matter of the four Gospels of the accepted New Testament, but there is a Gospel of Mary Magdalene, there is a Gospel of Thomas, etc., etc. Well, all of these Gospels tend to be absolutely wonderful texts. The works of Paul, not so much. <laughs> and again, you need to look at the individual texts. So this is why, yeah, at no point have I ever made the statement that quite literally, for example, <clears throat> all of the texts found in the Bible are bad. I've never said that. Indeed, I have actually said the four Gospels are wonderful. Uh, the rest, uh, mixed to bad. Everything ranging from mixed to, indeed, asuric. Very good. So I hope that answers the question somewhat. Very good. Sri Ram, thank you so much for your kind words. Hmm. <clears throat> very good. Here is uh, here's an interesting, uh, very good question from Jacob Scott. Namaste Acharyaji. Is liberation and self-realization necessarily by the grace of God alone, or can one reach it by their own efforts as well? Very good. Good, good question, actually. <clears throat> and indeed, self-realization and liberation are not necessarily the same thing. Self-realization is very specific. Again, this is it has several terms, including Kaivalya in, in the Yoga Sutras, more commonly in the Vedantic context, self-realization is known as Atma Jnana, the term that I often use, etc. Uh, self-realization, uh, like God consciousness, uh, Brahma Vidya, is something that is very, very specific versus liberation, which is a more general, generic sort of term that can mean self-realization alone, or it can include other things as well, including God consciousness. So just to be a little bit a little bit technical, there is a difference between, let's say, atma jnana versus moksha, or liberation. Uh, in any case, it is indeed through the grace of guru and God that we have both. So indeed, it is really not possible for a person in complete isolation, uh, starting from nowhere, to come to the point of either self-realization or what to speak of liberation, including, including God consciousness, without the element of grace. And grace meaning both the grace of guru, that is, having, having a, a mentor, having a spiritual mentor, having someone who has traversed the path before us, who can now lead us safely upon that same path. We need Guru Prasada. We need the grace of Guru, and we need the Bhagavata Prasada. We need the grace of God as well. Now, interestingly, and I'll just, I'll try not to spend too much time with this, but also go a little bit in depth. The truth of the matter is the way that we achieve both self-realization as well as God consciousness, as well as liberation in general, is through a combination of our own efforts that then lead to our opening ourselves to, indeed, that saving grace of the divine. So it's not a matter of one or the other, which sadly you see this both in Christianity as well as some elements of more modern, let's say, Sanatana Dharma, the more modern Vedic tradition. And again, by modern, I mean the last 2,000 years or so, where people tend to think, oh, it's one or the other. Either you have to do a lot of self-effort or you need grace. 
Uh, the truth of the matter is the Vedic scriptures teach us that both are necessary. And indeed, in order to open ourselves to that grace which is ever present to begin with anyway, the way to open ourselves to that is indeed to do the self-effort that is necessary to indeed open ourselves to that grace. And what does that mean? Sadhana. That means we must do sadhana. We must do the practices that are necessary to reform ourselves from our illusion in such a way that then we become open to that ever-present grace. So we need both self-effort and grace. So I hope that answers the question. <clears throat> Very good. All right, very nice. Uh, here is here is a a good question actually. Rambles of a silent mind. Dear teacher, are memories stored in the physical mind or are they stored in the soul? Very good. Now I just need to qualify this a little bit uh, by physical by physical mind. I assume you don't mean the brain. I assume by physical mind what you maybe mean is manas that is the actual mind substance, which itself is independent of and transcends the brain, but which uses the brain in the same way that software uses hardware. I assume that what you mean is precisely that, manas versus atman. And uh, the truth of the matter is it's stored in both. It's stored in manas, that is in mind, as storehouse of memory to then be used as data in order to then think. So that is where memory is stored and its purpose in being stored in manas, in mind very specifically. But then, atman, soul, being experiencer, being drashtur, soul ultimately is the ultimate experiencer of all things and thus retains those experiences in the form of also what we would call memory. But in this case, uh, as experiential, not functional. So not functional memory in the same way that uh, intellect uses the data of memory to then think, but rather experientially, memory is also there in Atman. I hope that that makes sense, but that is the answer to your question. Very good. And again, due to time, of course, as always, I'm now going to have to probably skip a few questions, uh, many of which are quite good. Hmm. Very good. Here's one that I can answer in about two sentences. Uh, black stars, not holes. Uh, where does the philosophy of Neo-Advaita come from? Uh, Swami Vivekananda, very specifically. He is the founder of what is called Neo-Advaita. Uh, that's accepted by everyone and anyone who knows anything about uh, quote-unquote Hinduism, Vedanta, etc. That's accepted by scholars, etc. Vivekananda is considered to be the person to, to start what is today called Neo-Advaita versus the actual Advaita of Shankaracharya. So I hope that answers the question. Hmm. Very nice. Here is a very good question from uh, Narasingha, and you know who you are. <laughs> And Narasingha, very good to, to hear from you. Namaste Acharyaji, wonderful talk, thank you. Is there an order of texts one should take uh, for systematic Shastra study and how to approach Shastra study to make it most fruitful? Example, daily amount, uh, contemplate, etc. Excellent, very, very good, very practical question, actually. And let me certainly answer this. Certainly of all the various texts uh, that are available now as far as the Vedic texts, always the first book to start with is Bhagavad Gita. This is, this is pretty commonly accepted. I think most uh, legitimate gurus would say this as well. The Bhagavad Gita is a wonderful place to start, the reason being that the Bhagavad Gita is commonly accepted and has been forever as the most perfect summary study of the teachings of all the other Vedic scriptures. In other words, if you want to know the, the juice, the nectar, if you want to know the very gist of what all the other Vedic scriptures are saying, 
read Bhagavad Gita because there is almost nothing of importance that is left out of Bhagavad Gita. So that's the first place to start. Now from there, after reading Bhagavad Gita, I would then go on to Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam is much bigger than Bhagavad Gita, and it is a work that as soon as you begin to read it, you see that it is uh, presented in the very same spirit as Bhagavad Gita, but it goes infinitely, infinitely more in depth. So whereas Krishna will state something in a very cursory, very quick sort of way, the Srimad Bhagavatam now will go very, very in-depth into the teachings of Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and there are more reasons than this that I don't have time to go into. Uh, Srimad Bhagavatam is considered to be one of the most perfect of all Vedic scriptures because the Srimad Bhagavatam also, like Bhagavad Gita, uh, gives you the gist of everything else that is of importance. So I would go directly to Srimad Bhagavatam. Another important reason is because it is the Purana of Bhagavan. In other words, it is focused on more so than even many of the other Vedic scriptures. It is focused exclusively on God and devotion to God. So for this reason, I would go next um, to the, uh, to the Sh Srimad Bhagavatam. From there, I would begin with the, let's say, more important, the more accessible of the Upanishads. And depending on who you listen to, that means the 12 or maybe the 14 most important Upanishads. And they include many of the Upanishads that we know, the Isha Upanishad, Shvetashvatara, Kena, uh, Mandukya Upanishad, Inarayana Upanishad, etc. Uh, there is a listing of approximately 12 to 14 Upanishads that are considered to be very, very important. Uh, I would then begin with those. Uh, then after that, after reading the, uh, the Upanishads, I would then turn to the Sutra literature. And what this means is Yoga Sutras. It means the Narada Bhakti Sutras. But it also means the other Sutras that are a little bit less known. So the Nyaya Sutras, for example. Uh, there is a, a, a vast array of Sutra literature. Uh, at that point, after you've read all that, Come back to me and I'll recommend more, <laughs> but I'll stop there. But then also to answer the second part of your question, and that is how one should approach Shastra study. <clears throat> that is a very important question that actually uh, I've even told several of my students that I would like to give an entire talk on this at some point. I haven't done this yet. And that is that how we approach the study of scripture is how we approach any other sort of sadhana, and that is meditatively. You know, when it comes to Shastra study, what is called Svadhyaya, when it comes to Shastra study versus reading a book, what we call reading a book, there is a vast difference between the two. And I, I talked about this a little bit in the past, how there are millions of books that are out there, and the way that you read a book is uh, basically you just use your eyes and your intellect, and that's about it. You just read the book, you half pay attention, etc. It may be fiction, nonfiction, it may be philosophical, it may be trivial. But in any case, there's a certain way in which a person reads a book that is in a very non-concentrating, non-meditative sort of way. This is not how we read scripture. The way we read scripture is by, first of all, understanding that in reading, for example, Bhagavad Gita, it's not like reading a Barbara Cartland novel. For those of us, for those of you in the audience who are old enough to remember who that is, she was a person who wrote dozens of trashy romance novels. It's not like reading a Barbara Cartland novel or any other sort of novel. No. When we read scripture, it should be done as a sadhana. That is, first of all, you do your actual sadhana first. You do puja, you do meditation, etc. Then being still in that meditative frame of mind, now you read the scripture. You read the scriptures slowly. See, it's not a race. A lot of people think that, okay, let me read the Bhagavad Gita, okay, verse after verse after verse, and you just zoom through the verses. No, you read, you can read one verse and contemplate that one verse for weeks, if not months, if not years. You read slowly. You read a few verses, and you do so in a very reverential way, understanding that these are the words of God. As you're reading these verses from the Vedic scriptures, you allow these words of God to penetrate deep within you and to heal you. You meditate 
you're in a meditative frame of mind that is you're calm and peaceful, focusing on your breath, even as you're reading. And then after you've finished reading a verse, indeed, now you contemplate it. Oh, and there's a difference between meditation and contemplation. Again, these are more words that today in the modern world, spiritual people just kind of throw around and think they're the same thing. If they were the same thing, they would be the same word. No, meditation is indeed the systematic practice of focused awareness upon one object. Contemplation is now thinking, thinking, but in a calm way, in a spiritual way, about either that object or indeed something you've read. So now you contemplate what you've read. So this is the best way to approach the study of scriptures. So I could go much deeper. Like I said, <clears throat> I could actually give an entire talk about this, but we'll stop there for now. Very good. And let me see if maybe I can answer one more question. And again, if I am skipping your question, please forgive me. It's not because your question wasn't good, but at this point, I need to look at many of the questions and pick what I think is uh, hopefully a very good one. Here's a nice comment. William Seaborn says, thank you for exposing New Age paths and frauds. Absolutely, William. My absolute pleasure. <clears throat> I wish it wasn't necessary, but sadly, in today's age, it is. Hmm. Very good. Here is a very personal question, but I think a question that many people can relate to, and uh, I would like to answer this, actually. And this is, uh, this is a question from Jesse P. Namaste. How do I get out of the loop of boredom and feeling like I have no purpose? Everything is fine at work, then I get home and it hits me like a brick in the face every day. <laughs> That's a good, good way of describing it, actually. Yeah. First of all, let me just say, uh, yes, like with so many of these of these very unfortunate states of experience that people are experiencing today, very specifically, uh, you're not alone. This is sadly something that many, many, many people today experience. And of course, we can go into the historical and sociological and cultural and even spiritual, let's say spiritual historical reasons for why this is the case. We know that in most cultures today, not just quote-unquote Western culture, but most world cultures today, meaning has been exorcised from our surroundings, from our culture, from our day-to-day -day life, our day-to-day -day existence. You know, there was a time when people seemingly had less in the past, less meaning, less access to entertainment, less access to information. There was no internet at one point. I know people who are under a certain age find that impossible to believe, but at one time, Yes, smartphones didn't exist, the internet didn't exist. Uh, and yet, at one time in history, people were not as bored as they are now. Now everyone's bored. We have a billion bits of information at our fingertips, and yet we're bored. We have a billion bits of entertainment at our fingertips, and yet we're bored. The reason why this is the case is indeed because meaning itself uh, is something that we have been deprived of, and very purposefully. You know, we live... We live under a regime of atheism. You know, let's let's not uh, let's not beat around the bush or play games about this. You know, we have been we, meaning most of the nations of the world, have been under regimes that, for multiple, multiple, multiple generations, uh, made up their mind. They made the decision a long time ago that there is no God, that religion is poison, and that we are all just two-legged animals, and they are going to treat us as such. And as a result, meaning is something that's been taken away from us. So now people get bored. Now people get bored. You see, again, if, if you could somehow interview people 100 years ago, they didn't have time to be bored. They had so much going on and so much meaning in their lives. But now, getting making this very personal for you, because I'm sure you understand this, but that's not your question. Your question is, well, what do I do? to not have this feeling of boredom, but also having no purpose in life. 
What is boredom? What is the sense of having no purpose? It's a vacuum. It's a black hole that's there. And again, it's a black hole that at one time was filled by God, by religion, by spirituality. But now that's gone. Now we have this black hole. What do we do? We need to refill it. You, Jesse, need to refill it. And what does this mean? This means that, indeed, the way that you find purpose in life is that you find purpose in life. A, you understand that that purpose ultimately must be spiritual. That is, it must be of the most important thing imaginable. That purpose is not going to be found just doing other things, just feeding a homeless person. Oh, that should be done, but not that alone. Not just rescuing an animal. Oh, that should be done, but not that alone. Ultimately, purpose is found in looking for that which is of the ultimate purpose that which is of eternal purpose. In other words, the spiritual. So you can indeed have a true sense of purpose in your life. What you need to do is to embrace the spiritual. And what this means, in turn, embracing the spiritual, is not just intellectually, not just that, oh, well, I agree with these spiritual concepts. Oh, my Lord, this is so much today, unfortunately, what people think it means to be spiritual. That, oh, I accept intellectually these spiritual precepts. All right, now I'm spiritual. No. What it means is, if you want purpose in your life, you need to indeed fully embrace a spiritual lifestyle. Now, don't worry. I'm not telling you to leave your life behind. You said you have a nice job that you like and become a monk somewhere. No, that's not what I'm saying. On the contrary, it's, not, it's wonderful that you seem to enjoy your job. The problem is everything else. With everything else, you can indeed fully embrace a spiritual lifestyle while still having your job and having everything else that you have. I don't know if you have a family or you're planning on having one. Oh, you can have a family. You can, have, you can be in school, etc., etc. You can do all the important duties that there are in this world. But at the same time, what it means to have... A spiritual lifestyle is that you have God in the center of everything that you do. You have God in the center of your career. You have God in the center of your family. You have God in the center of every single thing that you do. And now in turn, how do you do that? You do those practices that are necessary and that are designed to help you to personally experience God and the presence of God in your life, here and now. That, that is meditation. That is yoga. Again, like I always say, not just yoga meaning uh, doing headstands and the downward facing dog. No, yoga meaning the full system of yoga, philosophically, spiritually, practice-wise, etc., so this is what I, what I would say to you, Jesse. If you want to find purpose in your life, have God be that purpose. Have God reveal to you what that purpose is by turning to God, having God in the center of everything that you do. And how you do that is begin to meditate upon God daily, in a daily sort of way. Have this be your sadhana. Have this be your practice such that you have an actual blissful experience of God. And believe me, once you have experienced God, not just accepted, again, intellectually, oh, God exists. No. Once you have personally experienced God in your life, boredom ceases to exist. Indeed, I've actually said this many times, that for the yogi, for the self-realized sage, for the sage who has God consciousness, boredom does not exist. I can tell you, I am someone who, my students know this, anyone who's been around me know this. I never get bored. The word boredom has never come out of my mouth. And I can be doing anything. I can be in the midst of activities, teaching, doing all sorts of things. Or I can be sitting somewhere, either reading a book or somewhere in nature, just looking out into nature with no one talking to me, alone or with someone else. And I'm never bored. But the only reason why is because I've embraced God. You can do this too. You can do this too. You don't have to feel bored. And you don't have to feel as if you don't have purpose in your life. This is a very short, very small, very brief answer. But ultimately, of course, this is something that takes practice. 
So I would ask you, Jesse, that indeed you, uh, you supplement your knowledge with wisdom, read our books whenever you can, so especially Sanatana Dharma, The Eternal Natural Way. If you don't have this book already, please get that book. Please get Living Dharma, another wonderful book. Please get our introduction to Sanatana Dharma. So read these books, but also begin to practice. As far as how to practice, look at some of our older videos. Indeed, go to our playlists. You will have many videos that we have on meditation that will show you how to meditate. Also in the books, it explains how to meditate. Continue to watch these videos. Continue to associate with other individuals who are spiritual. And in this way, by practice and practice and practice, you will experience God in your life. And believe me, once that happens, you will have a sense of purpose in your life like you never even believed was possible. And boredom will cease to exist. Every moment of your life will be a thrill and will be ecstatic. So I hope that's helpful for you. With that, we've certainly gone over time by about 16 minutes or so, and I, I, I thought we would today. I didn't tell anyone, but I, uh, I knew we would go over time a little bit just due to the fact that this was a very long passage that we looked at today, and I really wanted to get to people's, uh, people's uh, questions. But we will stop here for now for those for whom... I could not get to your questions. Oh, I apologize. And I know, I'm sure I haven't even seen them all. I'm sure that there are wonderful, wonderful questions that are here. Again, just due to time, I won't be able to get to any more. But I thank you for being here. And again, I ask you that you please go to dharmacentral.com when you have a chance. When you're there, please look at the books that I mentioned. The books are available. You know, all the books, especially Sanatana Dharma, The Eternal Natural Way, Living Dharma, The Dharma Manifesto, so many of our books that we have. Join our email list when you can. And also, again, if you would like to help us to continue helping others. The only way that we can do this is through very practical help. We are a nonprofit. We are a 501c3, to state it very technically. We are a nonprofit a religious slash spiritual movement. That being the case, we need everything. We need donations. We need volunteers. We need as much help as possible. So when you're at Dharma Central, if you would like to donate, please do so. You can donate a dollar. You can donate a million dollars. If you would like to become a tithing member where once a month you donate a little something, again, any amount, a dollar, a million dollars a month, whatever, please do so by visiting dharmacentral.com. And again, help us to continue helping you and so many, so many uh, untold numbers of people who are out there who are benefited by all the work that we are doing. Me, I'm just the, I'm just the person who teaches. It's my disciples, actually, who I'm grateful for. They're the individuals who actually help me to really get the word out as much as possible. But again, help us in any way that you can. With that, I thank you again for being here. Please join us again next Monday, where again, next Monday, we're going to be doing something a little bit special. I won't give away what it is. Just be here next Monday if you want to see what this special thing is that we'll be doing. And with that, namaste. Jaya Sriman Narayana. Jaya Bhagavan Shri Krishna Sanatana Dharma Jayate Dharma Rashtra Jayate and Jaya Shri Guru Om Hari Om. With that, everyone, please take very, very good care of yourselves until next we meet.